But to go back to the beginning, Dorothy was born in November of 1913, and it was one of the stormiest winters on record. And the, the area around the Great Lakes of North America were wrecked in that November. She was born in 1913, she died in 1996, and the, she came from a very large family, and it's that kind of large family that were mutually supportive and that developed some emotional maturity in individuals. There were three girls, there were three boys. The mother, Bertie, and the three sisters all became involved with the spiritual movement, but the boys never did but they remained in a close family nevertheless. Russell, Russell Flexer was born in 1914, in October, I think it was, in 1914, and both Russell and Dorothy were born in Pennsylvania. Russell was born uh, near Reading, and uh, Dorothy was born in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is a, an industrial town some 40, 50 miles west of, of Philadelphia. There were two influences that Russ, Dorothy said at the end of her life were the most important things to her, religion and music. And Dorothy had a very fine operatic voice and could have trained in, as an opera singer or as a singer. And Russell himself could play violin and was very musical. And music to both of them was important as, as religion was. Dorothy's father, Otto, was a manager of a hosiery mill or a supervisor in a hosiery mill in the area of Reading. And Russell's father was a conductor on the trains. Now, you know the Polar Express, and you've got Tom Hanks in that wonderful outfit. There's a wonderful photograph of, of uh, Russell's father wearing just that. It's pure Americana. Let me show you something else here. This is a photograph of Dorothy taken in the mid-1950s. Here is a thumbnail photograph of Russell, probably taken around the end of the 1940s, early 1950s, just below my big fingers there. We have the Shrine of the Master Church at Sarasota, which is the church that they founded there. And this is the stained glass window in that church, which you can just about see and the figure of St. Francis, which stands in the gardens at that church. Um, Dorothy's father, Otto, in addition to his work, was the secretary of a local lodge. Now, it was probably a Masonic lodge, but it may not have been. Um, as part of his duties, excuse me, as part of his duties, he, he would supervise the hiring of the hall this is in the late 20s, early 1930s. And some of the people who hired those halls were mediums who gave, came along and to give demonstrations of mediumship. The family attended, uh, as did Otto, and the family also were aware of uh, vibrational healers, faith healers, as they were called at the time, in the neighborhood. And if you couldn't afford a, a medic, a doctor, you would go to see the faith healer who perform laying on of hands. So there was some background in the families, uh, in, the, in the family of spiritual matters. In Otto, Dorothy's father, predicted that he would die at the age of 50. And Dorothy said that she was with him on the eve of his birthday and he was reading a paper in his chair, much like this chair, and he, he uh, she saw written on the back of the newspaper, the story of his sudden death, and sure enough, he died at the age of 50. This was in 1933. In 1932, in nearby Ephrata in Pennsylvania, which is about 20 miles west of Reading, Ethel and Post Parish had opened the Camp Silver Belt, had opened Camp Silver Belt at the Ephrata Park there. The, the camp was a summer premises, a summer meeting place for their church, which is the spiritual temple and school in Miami in Florida. It's too darn hot in summer to do uh, materializing and physical mediumship work in Florida. So they'd opened a summer camp. As we were discussing last week, one thing that's unique about American spiritualism 
is that they have summer camps and these camps are residential all year round and in summer they open their premises to visitors the church is closed as a rule and they would go and take their vacation their holiday at these summer camps there are still 11 ca such camps in the united states and ethel and myron post in 1928 branched out from camp chesterfield founded their church and temple in miami and then started Camp Silver Bell in 1932 at Ephrata in Pennsylvania, 20 miles from Reading. They, um, they, they start, the family started to attend there, and it had been intended that Otto and the family would go to a materializing sale with Ethel Post Parish. If you've been in on these talks previously, you'll know that Ethel's mediumship, let me introduce you to Ethel, This is Ethel Post Parish, the new book, which is out in June, Ethel Post Parish, Mediumship in America. Fabulous hat, you made it, I think. Ethel Post Parish had a unique capacity to give, to allow multiple manifest, multiple materializations. So in the space of an hour long sitting, you may have four or five materializations in the hall at once plus Silver Bell, her, her Indian guide, and others sometimes. At one point, a man called Fred Harding, who was a close friend of the Posts, counted 44 materialization in, in, at any one, in one sitting. So Ethel had a unique capacity for materialization. She must have had a very strong constitution. And after Otto Graf's death, Dorothy, her brother Ruth, her mother Bertie, and possibly her other older sister Helen attended a materialization seance at Camp Silver Bell with Ethel Post. What happened was that her father materialized, and as she, she, she herself said, and I'm quoting, gave convincing proofs of his identity. And it's that kind of unique experience, isn't it? It's that unique experience that changes everything in their life, changes everything. And the, the family, from that point on, the girls, at least the women in the family, dedicated their life to the work of spirit. Dorothy and her sister Ruth started to attend the summer camps at, at Camp Silver Bell, and they were attending from at least 1933 to, the, to 1949, and undertook training with Ethel Post now, I know from a previous research that Ethel taught trumpet phenomena. It was, trumpet has a number of aspects. Uh, firstly, trumpet in the light, where an ectoplasmic voice forms and the trumpet, and the recipient puts the trumpet to their ear like that, and they hear the voices of the departed. And levitation of trumpet, where the voices come directly out of the tube itself. In addition, voices could materialize in the dark, independent of the trumpet, direct voice as we call it. Ethel Post taught these techniques. She also taught materialization practices. She taught slate writing and she taught billet reading. I won't explain all of them, I think you're probably aware of what they are. Billet reading isn't very common, but it's a form of psychometry where you put a piece of paper in an envelope and the medium reads it without opening the envelope. Um, Myron Post and Eggy, Peggy Barnes Jeffs, Ethel's cabinet attendant, did the marking of the papers. So what happened, you have a summer season of six, eight weeks at, at Camp Silver Belt, eight weeks in fact, where Ethel did the practical work of training in mediumship, and Myron and Peggy did the coursework, which was a correspondence course. They had at least eight churches in their association and ordained at least 14 different ministers. And Ruth, uh, Ruth Graff and Dorothy Graff were ordained by Myron Post in 1939 at Camp Silver Bell. Um, in 1940, oh sorry, I'm dripping the gun a bit. In 1937 at Reading, 
Ruth and Dorothy founded their first church, the Friendly Church of Truth. Now, you notice the word truth has cropped up a number of times. Probably Ethel and Myron had had negative experiences of mediumship in the past and wanted to emphasize quality, they wanted to emphasize the truth and high standards. And Ethel herself was a perfectionist in everything she did, from her appearance down to, down to the most trivial of things, she was a perfectionist. And in her work, she wanted to emphasize the truth. And the truth became a central theme to Dorothy Flexer's life. And it's almost certainly from Ethel that she adopted it. So going back to 1937, Ruth and Dorothy found the friendly church of truth. That town was to have three spiritualist churches up to 1916. Um, also in 19, around that time, Dorothy met a, a young man called Russell Flexer. She later wrote that a, a nice young man came into the church and it was her to be her future husband. They married in 1940 and they had a daughter, Eileen, who is now the Reverend Eileen Courtney, in 1944. They only had the one child. One of the most traumatic incidents in Dorothy's early life was the death of her sister, Ruth. They were very close. Uh, she developed a, an illness called strep, uh, strep throat, streptococcus, and it was a very quick death. Uh, Ruth was married, she was known as Mrs. Ruth Schaff, and she had children. And the blow to Dorothy was lifelong. In 1940, Russell had been training as a welder. Now you may know that up to that point, ships had been bolted together. After 1940, the process was speeded up back through welding. Come the war, World War II, 1940, 1941 in America, the couple moved to Norfolk, Virginia, where, which was a major, um, major naval base, the United States Navy on the east, on the Atlantic coast board. And Russell was war work exempt because of his welding skills. So the move, moved to Norfolk, Virginia. Um, in that year, 1941, they joined the, 1940, they joined the Memorial Spiritualist Church in Virginia. That church still exists. And Unfortunately, as so many secretaries do, they've thrown out the notes, so there is no archive of the period in which Russell, uh, Russell and Dorothy were involved with that church. But Dorothy was to say that at the Memorial Spiritualist Church in Norfolk, Virginia, that she learned many of the pastoral skills that, they, that she brought to her future role as a reverend. As we were saying last week, if you thought the told, in America, mediums train as mediums and then they train to become ministers. That gives them protection under the constitutional guarantee of religious freedom. It does not give them <laughs> protection from accusations of obtaining money under false pretenses, however. And there's been a conflict which allows the police forces and journalists to persecute Americans in, in America because they don't believe in mediumship and they believe that the medium was uh, obtaining money and the false pretenses. Now, Dorothy was a very fine trumpet medium, as we say, for over 50 years. There was an incident which illustrates the dangers of physical mediumship very well. In 1935, Dorothy's sister, Ruth, and her mother, Bertie, attended a seance given at the Daniel Byrne Hotel in Reading. This is in October of that year, the camp ran from late June to early September, and Ethel and the other mediums would work in the local churches around there for some months prior and, and afterwards. The, a policeman, the policeman, Walter Deans, enrolled in the seance under a false name, and when the seance got started, he had a materialization come forward for him. What he did, he stood up and he grabbed the materialization. And at the same time, with the, the row and kerfuffle, the police, police officers who are in plain clothes out, or outside the sound room, burst into the chamber and grabbed the medium and grabbed her assistance. It's a known, when I looked through the, when I was doing the research on this incident, 
Ethel, who is the medium, not Dorothy, Ethel, her name disappears from the record from October to March of next year. Now, I can't say that she was injured, but almost certainly she was, almost certainly she was. Walter Deans arrested Ethel, arrested Peggy Barnes Jeff, and arrest, arrested John Rees and took them down to the jail at Reading and incarcerated them overnight. The, the seance, the circle, the, the, the classes as they were known as, was outraged. This was on the same evening. And after the police had, had left, they got up a spontaneous demonstration and marched from the hotel room downtown, down to the police station and protested outside the police station. And they all signed affidavits, all signed affidavits that what that been going on there was a genuine religious experience and genuine forms of mediumship were being demonstrated. Following day, the three of them, Ethel, Peggy and John Reese, appear before the bench, down comes the hammer, case dismissed, religious freedom. Uh, with the end of World War II, going back to Norfolk, Virginia, the troops are returning from the European theatres and Japanese theatres and Russell was asked to stand aside to give returning, a returning soldier a job at the shipyards. Florida, from 1901 up to the present, has, at the moment, I think it's got a population of something like 18 to 22 million. It's, it's huge. But Florida, from 1920 onwards, was a boom state. There was a property boom in the early 1920s. In the 1930s, people from the northern states started to commute and take by holiday homes down there. They're called the snowbirds, aren't they, to this day. The snowbirds were starting to develop property. In the area, area of Tampa, there's the McGill Air Force. Because Florida is really rather flat, but it is very flat, no mountains in Florida. They developed the McGill Airport, the, which was a major hub for the United States Air Force, which of course supports a lot of light engineering industries around it. Russell could find work in Tampa. So in 1946, 47, the couple leave and drive south to Tampa. Um, Dorothy was to say later in life, it was like leaving the gray skies of Pennsylvania for the sunny climates of Florida, and you can just imagine the sweet oleander smells. Of course, um, Russell found work. Tampa was a growing city. The whole state was growing. When you look at the record of churches, in 1949, <laughs> the phone's ringing, folks. I'll get the producer to turn it off. In 1949, Tampa had four spiritualist churches, and nearby St. Petersburg had another six. Altogether, the number of churches in that area was to grow to something like 27 by, 19, by 1960. So spiritualism was a growing religion at that time. Um, Ethel and Myron Post divorced in 1939, and the church, and the, sorry, the temple and the school that they'd started, the, spirit, the temple and spiritual school of truth, uh, virtually dissolved, really. So when they reached Florida, when they got to Tampa, Dorothy and Russell started their own First National Spiritualist Church and they affiliated to IGAS. When they lived up in Norfolk, they started a church at Portsmouth, Portsmouth Virginia, which is part of that great big bay of, uh, in Virginia there, on the other side of the bay from Norfolk. And they started the first Shrine of the Master. Their churches were known as Shrine of the Master. And Russell said that he received that name inspirationally. In that area also, and this will be news to British people, the American Harry Edwards had his church. He was called Fred Jordan. And he, he was a miracle worker like Harry Edwards. His, his name isn't really known over here. But Harry, uh, Fred Jordan, and Ethel and Dorothy were neighbors. Ethel, sorry, uh, Dorothy and Russell were neighbors and almost certainly they knew each other. They also knew Arthur Ford from around this time as well. 
Brett Jordan became president of the International General Assembly of Spiritualists and was president up to his death in 1974. So when they founded the first shrine of the master at Portsmouth and then the second church in Tampa, Florida, the second shrine of the master, they naturally associated that, affiliated that with the International General Assembly of Spiritualists. I tell you, as a researcher, tracking the byways of spiritualist organizations is a nightmare. In 1941, a couple, uh, John Bunker, Clifford Bias, and Robert Cheney had founded the Spiritualist Episcopal Church at Camp Chesterfield in, in Indiana. The second shrine of the master switched its affiliation to the Spiritualist Episcopal Church. Now, the reason being an Episcopal Church is governed by its clergy in the sense of that it has a, a, a presiding board, but it doesn't have a, a pope figure or you know, a senior clerical figure in charge of it. It's governed by its church, it's governed by its clergy. It also had a distinctly Christian flavor. Dorothy, while she'd been training in Pennsylvania, had attended the local college and taken up religious studies while, while she'd been there. In the 1940s, uh, uh, Dr. Russell took up a doctorate through a correspondence course with a college, a metaphysical college out in Indiana, which is now in uh, Arizona. The Spiritualist Episcopal Church, founded in 1941 at Chesterfield, developed into something of an organization of some 50 odd churches, mostly clustered around the Great Lakes. And Dorothy and Russell affiliated their church to that. And in 1952, Russell was ordained by uh, Clifford Bias and his colleague Lillian D. Johnson at a ceremony at Tampa. Um, Clifford Bias was a physical medium, weren't they all? They were, he was a trumpet medium, medium. Lillian D. Johnson settled at Brainton, just north of town, uh, just north of Sarasota, and she too was a trumpet medium. Russell and Dorothy kept up their association with Camp Silver Bell up to 1949. And I'm going to read you a little something here. Dorothy was listed as a spiritual counselor in the program for 1949, and she was listed as a direct voice medium and a billet reading medium as well. And Camp Silver Bell had um, what they're known as Saturday Auditorium Meeting, and they were given the name of Bazaar. <laughs> but it was bizarre in the sense of an outlet, a, a shop or a store, not in the sense of weird and wonderful. There were so many direct voice mediums that on one occasion in, in Camp Selva Bell's season for 1949, they gave an auditorium seance, and this was a regular weekly event. Um, the direct voice seance was listed by with Ethel Post Parish, Bertha Eckrode, who was also a physical medium, Elizabeth Fabian, Raymond Burns, Emma Munch, Dorothy Flexer, John E. Reese, Hugh Gordon Burroughs, Ernest Holden, Mary Fulton, Frank Decker. And that took place for the closing service at 10 p.m. That's 11 direct voice mediums in one sitting. And that was a weekly event. <laughs> what happened was uh, I, I got the explanation from Eileen, Reverend Eileen Courtney, Dorothy and Russell's daughter. They all took turns <laughs> to demonstrate their gifts. And the only, they're all listed as direct voice mediums. And only Ethel was listed in their programs as a materializing medium. But after Ethel's death in 1960, they're once again listed as materializing medium. The, be, the point being that Ethel was Queen Bee of Count Silver Bell, and only she was the acknowledged materializing medium but in fact several including Dorothy Flexer herself was a materializing medium. In 1955 in a reported Psychic Observer which was the American equivalent of Psychic News 
There is an account of Dorothy giving a materialization seance at the annual conference of the Spiritualist Episcopal Church. It wasn't something Dorothy went in for, and almost certainly she never gave materializing seances after 1960. Um, what? They were subsequently to leave the Spiritualist Episcopal Church. The, <clears throat> I'll come back to that. There was a book published by Alda Madison Way. As I was saying, the, the summer season this was so hot in Florida that the mediums, the materializing mediums, could only give seances in the cooler months, which meant effectively October through, through to April. And in 1953, this gentleman, Alder Madison Wade, published this book, um, uh, uh, indebted to Reverend Tom Newman for the, putting me in the direction of that. And this is an account of the classes, the seances, given by Reverend Dorothy over the winter of 1952 into the spring of 1953. Um, Dorothy had a number of key workers. I won't go too deeply into this, but notably Dr. Charles Davis. And I'm going to show you a few books. These are spirit teachings given through, through trumpet of Dr. Charles Davis. And these books are still available to this day. And there was a number of other leaflets dictated and given through through direct voice media from the mediumship there. The um, Ethel and Dorothy fell out. I, I imagine that they're both quite strong characters. Dor Dorothy had inquired of Ethel about the possibility of developing a spiritualist church in, in Sarasota. And Ethel replied that the, t the town had been tried and had not found to be welcoming. Dorothy and Russell felt that they were drawn and spirit directed and was directing them to start a church of a shrine of the master at Sarasota. There may have been theological differences between Dorothy and Ethel in that Dorothy always wanted mediumship to be the tool of teachings of spirit. Dorothy was speci specifically Christian and wanted a, a Christian culture for her church. Ethel was broad church Christian, let's say. And for that reason, the two didn't get on and Dorothy disregarded the advice of Ethel and Ethel took umbrage and the two never spoke again. Um, I'm going to show you a little photograph now. Whilst Russell was working, Russell was continued to work as a welder while they built up the churches. And Dorothy, with their daughter Eileen, and with the, her mother Bertie, travelled from Tampa to Sarasota, which is some 60 miles, on roads that uh, nowadays we have freeways and interstate, but of course back in the 50s before Eisenhower, Eisenhower built the freeways, these were one road, one lane up and one lane back. And of course it's very hot in Florida. And Mother Bertie and Dorothy and Eileen traveled every week down those 60 miles there, 60 miles back to establish a shrine of the master at the Woman's Club in Sarasota. And this is a, a postcard of the Gandhi Bridge that they crossed Tampa Bay. Anybody who's been across Tampa Bay will know it. actually it's huge. It's a really, it's a very, very big bay indeed. Um, the church did take off. And in 1952, I believe it was, they acquired property at Browning Street, which became the Shrine of the Master. Um, in 1956, John Bunker, who was one of the founders of the Spiritualist Episcopal Church, died. Dorothy was vice president to that role and automatically assumed that role prior to the AGM of that year, which would have had another election. Now, as I was saying earlier, the word Episcopal 
means rule by bishops or rule by the clergy. But this put Dorothy in a in position of governing the board uh, of the Spiritualist Episcopal Church that governed the behavior of clergy. In that year, there was a morality accusation against a senior member of the church who was standing for high office. A case was heard, the case was heard, and it was judged by the board, voted on, of course, judged by the board that that officer should not stand for office, that clergyman should not take up office. This caused the spiritual Episcopal Church to split, and Clifford Bias and Lillian D. Johnson left, taking half the church membership, taking half the affiliated churches with them. That's, and they set up the United Spiritualist Association. The, um, they parted company in a big way, and that meant that the rump of churches left were based around the Chicago and Great Lakes area with Dorothy's church way down south in Florida with very other few churches. Now, they did put on a school and seminary in St. Petersburg in 1957. But in 1958, Dorothy and the board at Sarasota decided that the Episcopal Church was just too far away. There was no replies to letters and that Dorothy and the board decided that they should start their own church. And their unique idea was the Church of Metaphysical Christianity. It would be specifically Christian based around metaphysics, with demonstrations of physical phenomena to underwrite the, the teachings of spirit. It was a model church in the sense that the Church of Metaphysical Christianity was a separate board from the Shrine of the Master at Browning Street. The board of the Church of Metaphysical Christianity, uh, you could have, other churches could affiliate to it. And a number of churches did do so. And altogether, I think there was something like four or five churches affiliated to the Church of Metaphysical Christianity. One of them, <laughs> one of them was headed up by a woman called May, May, Myrtle B. Faithful. <laughs> Myrtle B. Faithful, what a wonderful name. She wasn't faithful, and her church broke away within about two years. The Clifford Bias, Lillian D. Johnson Church, was different from other spiritualist groups. And this is important because they, uh, they met, uh, they had a, a premises in Indiana and that they, they had a mystery cult initiation ceremonies in, in this cave, in Maple Grove it was called, in Indiana where they taught mystery school teachings. So it went down an esoteric line Spiritualism is an exoteric, there are no secret doctrines in spiritualism. Uh, Dorothy and Russell's Church of Metaphysical Christian Christianity was entirely uh, open and anyone could take up its practices and develop themselves. The, <clears throat> from 19, uh, Ethel Post Parish died in April 1958 and Hugh Gordon Burroughs, Peggy Barnes Jets, and John Reese invited Dorothy to work once more at Camp Silver Bell in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, which she did, and she did do so from 1959, I think, to 1961. After that, they never worked in any, any other churches but their own. Dorothy never worked outside the Church of Metaphysical Christianity again. Uh, Dorothy was to say of Peggy Barnes, Jeff, and Hugh, Hugh Gordon Burroughs and John Reese that they were fine teachers and fine mediums. Um, for them, it was the, the church itself had several influences. And <clears throat> I'm going to read you a piece here. Yeah. The American metaphysical to the british i think the word metaphysical sounds a bit like greek cooking or something it's a strange sort of word really it's got something to do with 18th century poets perhaps it's just not in our vocabulary very much in america 
the metaphysical movement grew from the writings of Emerson and Thoreau, the New England, New England mystics and philosophers, but uh, principally from another man called Phineas Quimby, who in the 1860s started to develop, to develop what we would know as spiritual healing techniques. And these techniques were not only physical, but they were also the spiritual and the mental. And this kicked off a movement of what was known as New Thought. There's a, any number of books to be read on this topic. People like Mar Mary Baker Eddy and the Christian Science Movement. And another couple, the Unity Church of Missouri, uh, uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, which had started in 1889. And they were all devoted to people exploring and developing their own spirituality. Metaphysical Christianity, and I've got a definition here, the word metaphysical literally means above the physical. Is metaphysical Christianity was therefore a science, a philosophy, and a religion based on the life teachings and demonstrations of the Master Jesus. It seeks to understand the invisible, spiritual nature of all life, and transcends the physical material planes in which we now live. Uh, God was the ultimate source from which all life flowed. And in Ralph Waldo Trine's phrase, in tune with the infinite, the more the individual could attune himself to the divine, the greater his life would become hereafter. Because in living the life here, it wasn't about living life in the future, it was a living constructive positive life here and now and that was the essence of metaphysical christianity um whilst they were specifically christian or new thought the flexors believed that there was no redemption of man in the vicarious sacrifice of an only son of a vengeful deity they, there was, they did not ascribe to the doctrine of atonement. God, uh, Jesus, did not die for our sins. He died to demonstrate that life was eternal. Therefore, there was no belief in transubstantiation in the Church of Metaphysical Christianity. They did practice communion, but it was communion of the, of the community with the spiritual. In fact, they don't do that now. And... <clears throat> They also rejected original sin. Original sin in the in uh, it was Aristotle was originally meant to mean man's incapacity to forgive, which is a much more interesting and believable definition than uh, the Christian oh, born with a blot on your soul idea. The deity was not viewed as a medieval monarch or a capricious need. Sometimes he sounds God. He sounds like a bit like a dysfunctional one-parent family, seeking to get revenge on his own son. Vision of Jesus is not the religion of it's a religion of Jesus, not the religion about Jesus. That was Eric Butterworth, who was a Unity minister and only died in the beginning of this century. It was not the religion about Jesus. It was the religion of Jesus. Be thou put more be that perfect as your father in heaven is perfect it was a way of living we say spiritualism is a way of living and indeed spiritualism is a way of living uh, the flexors then from 1962 onwards dedicated them themselves <clears throat> to their own church theirs became a standalone organization in fact dorothy rarely talked about that um for Dorothy and Russell, it wasn't about the money. They weren't really bothered about money. Money was to be respected. It was a tool to be used, but they were not avaricious. They founded a lasting community at Sarasota, Browning Street in Sarasota. And let me just explain that the model in America, as I was saying earlier, of the camps, these summer, uh, uh, the residential communities, which had summer seasons, were open to the public was also a model which they followed too. Browning Street at that time was on the edge of town. It's actually, it's, it's rather in the middle of town nowadays, but at that time it was on the edge of town and, and the, prop, the land was there to be developed. 
In total, they developed five office buildings. There's the, te the church, the temple, the shrine of the master, which is the, that building there. The lovely building inside. They had an education hall. They had an office. They had the Davis Hall, named after Dr. Charles Davis, Dorothy's guide there. And in 1972, they opened the chapel. The chapel is a circular building with an entry foyer, a lobby, as the Americans say, and with no windows. And it was built purposefully for Dorothy's classes. She held classes uh, two days a week, I think it was Tuesday, when, Tuesday, Thursday. And they could be held in perfect, perfect darkness. Eventually, Dorothy wasn't in trance, she didn't need to be in trance while the trumpets flew around. For the people who attended the Shrine of the Mask, it was an opportunity not only to listen to the teachings of spirit, it was also an opportunity to meet and consult with your guides and with your spirit helpers, which was how, how absolutely marvelous would that be? You could actually build, if you became a member of it, you could actually build up a relationship with your spiritual guide directly in a direct voice way which is of course something that was unique and as i said earlier metaphysical christianity was under underpinned by the phenomena of trumpet mediumship the trumpets flew and therefore science the um, contemporary understanding of physics was denied because the metaphysical reality were transcendent of this world they built the, the flexors built a lasting community Altogether, I think there was something like 19 houses developed around the in Browning Street and in the street behind. They developed 19 properties, 19 houses on top. I think there are still something like eight. The Flexors themselves had a parsonage, which was next door to the, the Shrine of the Master. And Bertie, Dorothy's mum, mother, you remember, and Mary, uh, Mary Flexor, Russell's mother, shared a house just behind. Um, Dorothy's older sister, Helen, also came to live at, in that community and became actively involved in, in the life of the Shrine of the Master. Her community was at the core of Dorothy and Russell's life at her service to that community. The American mediums who become ministers, because churches are few and far between, generally speaking, because the few and far between have a pastoral role, which was not really the case where you have a tight network of churches in this country where mediums go from one church to another. In America, the medium becomes a reverend, becomes a pastoral, takes up the pastoral role. That means perhaps match and dispatch, really, but it also means spiritual counseling. Now, Ethel, Ethel and Dorothy would give spiritual counseling sessions and the phone never stopped ringing. <laughs> uh, Eileen Courtney told me that. They were always on call. Whatever time of the day, if anyone of their community needed their help, and sometimes that was financial, that help was there. And they had to be repaid. But it, it, on occasion when it wasn't paid, didn't matter. They eventually... Uh, acquired a cottage up in uh, in the Carolinas, and uh, they would escape once in a while and go and take a break up there. And a friend of theirs who knew them well, excuse me a minute, Sally Hayden von Conter, who's now in her late seventies, a close friend of their daughter Eileen, uh, said, when they went on vacation, they were just like any other couple. Off came the robes, because American mediums wear robes often off came the robes and they relaxed and they were happy and they just ordinary guys hanging out as is what the phrase was this is red wing this is dorothy's one of dorothy's principal spiritual helpers and this photograph is snowdrop dr russell's guide and this painting sally hayden von Conta lives now in new mexico and is a talented artist and this was drawn probably in the 60s maybe 70s the community 
not only partook of spiritual activities, it was also a, a, a largely a social affair as well. They had all kinds of social activities, including trips to baseball. Uh, one of the key features of that was feeding people. After a Sunday service, there'd be donuts and coffee in the Davis Hall, and they put on foods, and food was a terrific fundraiser in the early days of the Shrine of the Master. They were forever cooking and feeding people, and it was all very reasonable rates. And food is often crops up in the photographs of the period. Um, they were respected, Dorothy and Russell. They were loved. I, I am their biographer. And it's the challenge of every biographer to discover what it was that, that made people love or hate them. Um, Richard Overy, the British military historian, says all biographers fall in love with their subjects. Well, they weren't saints. You know, they, there was only one way to peel potatoes for Dorothy. You can't cook roses like that. You would get turned off. If a member of the board started to acquire executive opinions beyond that which Dorothy was prepared to countenance, then they would get a sharp telling off. And uh, Dorothy had this phrase, don't let the door kick you on the when you leave. But they were respected and they were loved because of the service that they gave, because of the phenomenal mediumship that they could demonstrate. <clears throat> to them, the core of the Shrine of the Master is the spiritual enrichment of the individual, the creation of the community and the, and the source of the teachings themselves. In 1977, Russell developed a brain tumour. Now, I remember I mentioned uh, uh, Baker Eddy earlier. Um, she, her husband, who she founded Christian Science, and in her highly unreadable book, she, she would not allow her husband to receive treatment for cancer because he was supposed to be able to cure himself, and he actually died in agony. There was no way that Dorothy would do that to Russell. And in metaphysical Christianity, the, the healing aspect of man was complemented by the healing aspect of the medical profession. Russell himself credited spiritual or vibrational healing, as they call it in the, in the, the Shrine of the Master, with extending his life. Russell died in 1977, aged 63. So he was no, and he was um, a warm, cuddly bear of a man, with how Marie. Uh, Roe, who is still a member of the centre, remembers him. He was a mystic, and it was many of his ideas that were put into the Church of Metaphysical Christianity. Dorothy herself remarried in the some few years later, a man called Walter Hesk. Um, it was a case really of a marriage of friendship and of mutual need. Dorothy was of that generation which would not live openly with a man with whom she was not married. And the, the, uh, Dorothy did outlive her, him as well. Um, so we're coming to the end of this talk. The church, uh, Dorothy died in 1996, and I wish I could have met her, in 1996. And the church has continued because of the vision that Dorothy and Russell had for the church because there's a flexibility built into their practices. And in 2011, the, ch the church became the Sarasota Center of Light and it continues now under Reverend Jim Tu and the, uh, Joan Volpe, who's the president of the board there. It was their dearest work, it was, uh, uh, to conclude really, it was Dorothy and Russell's dearest wish that the teachings of spirit should be the principal focus of mediumship. Through her remarkable trumpet mediumship, twice a week for fi over 50 years, you could witness physics denied and hear the teachings of spirit and talk to your personal guides directly. I should add, actually, there were occasions, there were
were occasions for personal messages from them loved ones as well, particularly around the Christmas and New Year period. Uh, Dorothy actually was a capable, like Ethel Post Parish, she was a capable executive. Uh, she, she knew how to control a board. There was direction, there was authority, but she had that capacity to engage uh, support from other people. In other words, they were not egotistical. They, they were not avaricious. They weren't in it for the money. And they were loved because of that, and they are well remembered to this day. One, uh, speak, one person whom I interviewed said that Dorothy had an inner illumination. They had that because of the dedication, the generosity, and the adherence to high standards, and the love of the spirit world shone through her, and it was apparent to those who got to know her well. Um, I interviewed in 19, uh, sorry, I interviewed in 2015 a woman, Florence Strauss. Florence is now 93, still living in Sarasota and still a member of, of, of that church. And Florence said to me, Gerald, Florence has that wonderful direct, downright sort of American attitude. And she said that to me, Dorothy was, Dorothy was something else. Dorothy was nice. Dorothy was something else. And I thought it would be rather nice to give Dorothy the last word. And Dorothy wrote this herself. Wherever I may be, I may not know the people who will brush past me this day but I'll never forget that they too are creatures of the same spirit as I and deserve prayers of healing and abundance, understanding, love and peace. I dedicate my life to doing worthwhile things, saying uplifting and comforting words, and most of all, to being an example of true discipleship. <laughs> Dorothy was nice. Dorothy was something else. Next week, folks, we'll be...